Down, gone, caught. A wicket's down at the Adelaide Oval, and as the batsman trudges off, the crowd stirs as the next man in is the familiar style of David Hooks. For more than a decade, his very presence at the wicket has attracted attention because David Hooks is the kind of cricketer that the crowds love. From early days with World Series cricket to his stunning centenary test performance, and in dozens of great innings for South Australia, Hooksy has been a hero. Today he's batting against the Turing English side, caught in the last over of the day and he's not a happy man. But David heads off of the field with some consolation. After the game, a crowd of 1,000 people has gathered at the back of the grandstand to join Basim Pilko, Crackers Keenan, Doug Walters, Alan Jones, Wayne Phillips and Jeff Lawson for the David Hooks testimonial roast. Well, Hooksy, over the years you've, you've bagged a few guys. Now tonight it's your, your turn to cover it right back. Fair and square old son. I know, and that's why I only invited those folks that I knew wouldn't be as harsh as uh, plenty of others around the country. <laughs> so here he is tonight, ladies and gentlemen, the man, Slasher. He's great. Dougie Walters. I first came across Hooksy, I guess, uh, the real first time I came across him. It was a centenary test in Melbourne, which you all remember. And those poms that are with us tonight probably uh, are grateful that they weren't there on that particular occasion. He hit Tony Gregg for those five fours and that over. Give him a bit of cheek too in the meantime. I guess David fancied himself, his, himself at, uh, at cricket, tennis, golf. I think he just fancied himself. Uh, <laughs> I think my first memory of Doug uh, as, a, as a teammate was in the centenary test actually yep. and I know that he got a bit of a, a bagging himself in the press for not looking after the young kid at the other end but I'd faced a couple of balls in the first over and I started to walk down the wicket to, to see Doug at the end of the over and he just looked at me and he just winked and turned around and went back to his crease and I knew that he was with me and uh, not against me and I had a very strong memory in my mind of the support that Doug gave me just by doing that. What was he like in the rooms? different because he was such a card playing fanatic and a man who never went to the nets oh. and which wouldn't exist in 1990 of course no, it, it no. wouldn't be allowed so no. he was the last of those sorts of people and uh, loved to have a gamble and a bet and encourage others to bet and gamble because he set the, the rules. We both missed out on the 1981 tour of England it was rather unfortunate really because um, we missed out on the 501 odds that Marsh nearly got when they were over there on that tour. <laughs> Wasn't the first bet that uh, Dennis Lilly and Rod Marsh had had on a cricket field, I can assure you of that. They'd forgotten about the 1972 tour of England when Ladbrokes were operating their betting tent for the first time ever outside a test match in England for the three-day match Australia versus Yorkshire. Well, the first hour of play went by and we'd done pretty well. We got Yorkshire four for 40 at that time. There's a bloke by the name of Boycott had opened the innings and he was still out there at that stage, he'd opened the innings, he's still there, not out too. <laughs> In one of his more aggressive moods too, I might add. <laughs> I was feeling it fine leg at the time, right outside the lad broke's tent. Who should walk out the front door behind me but Dennis Lilly? I turned back over the fence and said he just made something favourite down there with Dennis. He said, not yet. He said, well, I'm about to. You blokes are 12 to 1 about getting five wickets in this session. I looked at the scoreboard, 4 for 40. I looked at the clock. We had an hour and a half to go to lunch. I said, this happens to be 20 in my trousers pocket up in the dressing room. Get it on for me as well. <laughs> the end of the over came and I thought, now, wouldn't that little fat bloke out in the middle with the weed keeping gloves on just love to know what's happening in the lad broke's tent? <laughs> I made a hurried dash to the centre of the over to, at the end of the over to inform Marshy. Didn't even have a look at the scoreboard or the clock. Get 20 on for me as well, he said. <laughs> there was Ian Chappell, the inquisitive captain he always was. One ring down the wicket, wondering what tactics we're talking about. We had to tell Ian. Had a casual glance at the scoreboard and said, you can slip me in for 20 as well. 
Well, we tried like hell, I tell you, for the next hour or so to get that fifth wicket. <laughs> it all happened about half an hour before lunch. Boycott's middle stump, cartwheel back. 11 or 12 spins, it's gone. Marshy's actually caught the stump in one of the ricochets as it's going by. It's not normally the occasion now on a cricket field when you see one's middle stump disappear that far back. The 11 blokes on the ground are peeling. <laughs> Cut a long story short, by lunch, York's here, six for 62. Everyone's walking off the ground, rubbing their hands together, doing their 12 times tables up the stairs into the dressing room looking for Dennis. <laughs> Dennis is not there, down the lunch room we go, there's Dennis into his lunch. The boys walked up and he said, you got our money? He said, no, he said, I haven't been down to collect yet. Well, you better get down and get it. Down to lead breaks, he's gone back a couple of minutes later, shaking his head, shrugging the shoulders. Sorry, boys, he said, I've got some bad news for you. I said, what do you mean, bad news? He said, about the bet. I said, hold on. I said, you told me it was 12 to 1 about getting five wickets in the session. We've done better than that. We got six. Yeah, that's where you made your mistake, he said. The bet was for five, not for six. <laughs> David Hooks, have a great season. Have a great night. My pleasure to be with you, and everyone else have a great night as well. Thank you. Another uh, character you've had an association with is Crackers Keenan. How did that sort of start, Hooksy? Well, I think Crackers has an association with everybody that, does, uh, yeah. that wanders around the streets of Adelaide. Mr Pepper and Salt. Uh, he's, he's into everything. And, but he's, he's a man who's he's a sportsman and he loves his sport. Yeah. And uh, I, I followed Collingwood uh, all my life. And with him having gone to Collingwood five years ago with Lee Matthews, uh, the bond just grew from there. Yeah. And we've done many, many sports nights together around the country. And I have a great affinity with him because he's just a lovable character. I've got to speak about David Hooks's uh, football career. <laughs> I've finished. <laughs> I'll never forget last year when we played uh, South Australia at the MCG and cleaned them out by about uh, 87 points, 92,000. Hungry punters turned up to have a look and I was talking to Hooksy afterwards and uh, the great David Mackay that played 260 four league games for Carlton's next to us and five premierships and all that. And he said, was he any good crackers at football? Because Hooks, he's telling lies. I said, yes, he's very good. He said, what did he do? I said, 49 games at West Torrance under 19s. <laughs> I said, but he was a premiership player. He sat on the bench. <laughs> you know, and that's about it. But he is a Collingwood supporter. And he still owes me 10 bucks from the tie I got him this year. And, uh, Earlier this year, I'd been doing a radio show with Ian Aiken and uh, Hooksy, and uh, they ring up the training rooms of a Monday night, and I tell lies, and uh, which is good because I enjoy it. <laughs> but before the grand final this year, uh, Hooksy, Hooksy rings me up and asks for tickets all the time, and uh, he bring, I send them over, and he scalps them. You know. Obviously, you had a special relationship with uh, with Flipper. Yes, I think in a team environment, can uh, particularly when you're the same age and you last for about yep. ten or twelve years, you, you tend to form a bond. Particularly in a town like this, where geographically it's easy to see people throughout the day. And you're both renegades. Well, he's a renegade, and I just try to sweep up and mop up <laughs> and clean him up behind. It's it, it's why well, I've lost my hair trying to control Phillips. Hooksy, another great dig was that uh, fantastic uh, partnership between yourself and Wayne Phillips when you broke the, the record. Uh, that must have given you a great deal of satisfaction. Well, yes, the, the enormity of scoring 300 and Flipper scoring 200. Unbelievable stuff. Yes, it, it's, it, it does give you satisfaction. Uh, but it wasn't a difficult attack uh, to play against. Uh, they didn't have uh, Gilbert, for example, mm. playing for Tasmania. And I remember Andrew Hilditch, who doesn't say very much at all, uh, he got out for 88, uh, caught uh, first slip by David Boone off the leg spin of Milos. And as he walked out, he said, oh, I've missed the supermarket picnic out here. <laughs> Ian McLaughlin rang Gary Sobers to tell him that we'd broken the the previous fourth wicket record partnership and Sober said, oh, so what? And McLaughlin said, yeah, they doubled it. <laughs> so, <laughs> which, uh, that impressed Sobey. Um, and then at 10 to 1, Wayne Phillips came down to me and said, uh, what are you going to do at lunchtime? I said, I'll probably declare. And uh, he said, declare now. Because at 10 to 1, you can't come out and bowl again. I said, why? He said, well, I can get a knot out here. <laughs> he wasn't prepared to risk the last 10 minutes. Always thinking of himself, Well, he could have played with a stump at that stage, of course. Uh, 
In 1907, once again a factual piece, 1907, a Mr G Dyes from Yorkshire played. He was a bowler. In 14 innings at the crease, his scores went like this. Zero, 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 not out. One, one not out. Zero, 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 one not out. And he followed it up with zero, zero, zero. It gave him a total of three from 14 innings. <laughs> Things picked up for Mr Dyes in the last three innings of the season. He scored four, one and 12, although I do think he did retire with cramp after his 12. <laughs> he finished with a season's average of 1.42. I hunted high and low through all the record books to try and find something similar. It was difficult. And what I did come across was an Australian batsman on a tour of Pakistan in 1980. <laughs> the batsman, he was not a bowler, he was a batsman. And he scores. <laughs> His scores were, in order, <laughs> five, three, Mr Magoo, yes, zero, zero, <laughs> two, zero. For a total of ten for a tour average for the Australian side of the promising young left-hander from South Australia of 1.66. <laughs> Will you please make welcome the one and only, the captain of the New South Wales cricket team, Australia's fast bowler, Jeff Lawson, if you will, thank you. Old telephone himself. My, my batting average in Pakistan in, in 1980 was 9.4. That's approximately eight times, David's. <laughs> the New South Welshmen are very, very good opponents to play against on the ground. Uh, they, they are very arrogant. They treat South Australians very badly on the ground, which I think is... Fair right and reasonable, but off the ground they're fine. And uh, I've roomed with Jeff Lawson in the West Indies a couple of times. Um, not great trips. I mean, uh, <laughs> Henry other and words, I. In other words, he's yeah. boring. Well, he doesn't have a drink. He's a boring old tart. No, so. he's not a boring old tart. I'll tell him that tonight. <laughs> no. um, but so we've had a, an affinity as a thing from a friendship, but it's been a, a respectful one because of cricket. And uh, I think it's it's marvellous that he is. Uh, deemed fit to come tonight, given what people's perception probably is of the relationship so I, I thank him for that. Larry Call played with Hooksy in 82-83 in the Ashes series here in Australia and he, he played pretty well, had a good series and the next season we went off to the West Indies and the West Indies is a place that, it's a great place to tour, there's no doubt about that, it's just not a great place to play cricket <laughs> they got these four big blokes, eight foot six, all in proportion Charge in, bowl halfway down the wicket. You know, you can have a few tough days at the ground, but it's a great place afterwards, you know. They love a gamble there. And like England, they also, you know, will gamble on their cricket. And I remember we played uh, a game at a place called St Kitts, which is a lovely little island in the West Indies, and it's the first game of the tour. And Hooksy was the vice captain for this particular game, and they had a little gambling tent going, and they had odds, you know. And Hooksy had just come off a pretty good season in Australia, and... They had odds that on that particular day, David Hooks making 100 was 15 to 1. And Hooksy, you know, fancied himself and thought he could bat a bit as well. And <laughs> he said, you know, mate, they're, they're pretty good odds. And I was fourth man for that particular game. I said, well, mate, I'll go down the tent, you know, we'll put a few bucks on. He said, yeah. I said, look, tell all the blokes, get a few dollars on this. 15 to 1, I'm feeling really good today, you know. We're only playing... I think it was the, the Windward Islands. I said, you know, they've got no one who can bowl. So why don't you get some money on? So we had a bit of a whip around. We got about $300. That's Eastern Caribbean dollars. And uh, got it on. So Hooksy, batting number three that day, gets in early. At lunch, 40 not out. Looking really good. Playing a few great shots. Footwork as good as ever. <laughs> Arthur Murray's proud of him. After T Hook goes out, 99 is on. There's a young spinner bowling, well, not so young, a guy called Harold Joseph, used to bowl out of the front, Jack Iverson's 
mystery spinner. There's a guy umpiring called uh, Douglas Sang Hu, very well-known West Indian umpire, umpired in World Series days, and he's at the, the bottom end, and JJ runs in a bowls, hooks his players back, and it just runs right along the deck, hits him right in the middle, right in front, pitch middle, hit middle, and all the boys have gone up. Not out. Jesus. You know, the boys in the, the dressing room say, oh, no, hooks. <laughs> Now you got away with that one, mate. It's not Adelaide. Two seasons and I'm pouring. What's going on? <laughs> so batting at the other end is Kim Hughes and, and Clay. He thought, geez, that's, that's out, you know. And pity should have got 100, but the umpire's given him not out. And Kim's just turned around to the umpire saying here and he said, Douglas, he said, that was very, very close. And Douglas had just pulled the betting slip out of the pocket and said, Yes, yeah, Martin, very damn close, I tell you. <laughs> but, uh, mate, thanks for inviting me. Great to be here. Been just a pleasure to be part of it. And I hope uh, everyone in South Australia gives Hooksy the support and the credit he deserves in his coming year. Thank you very much. But I always think that statistics remind me of the bloke who drowned in a river whose average depth was only three feet. <laughs> they, they simply don't make sense. And any overview of David Hooks ignores the phenomenal impact he's had on cricket and sport in this country. Everyone has talked tonight about the centenary test. Bill O'Reilly wrote the day after that audacious 56 that Hooks, and I quote, dragged this memorable match out of the entertainment doldrums. And he said, and I quote, above all, he has the courage to go after his shots with the adventurousness that enraptures the paying customer. And in a beautiful compliment, <laughs> and in a beautiful compliment to the young David Hooks, O'Reilly having written how Hooks had made what O'Reilly called a substantial mess of Tony Gregg's bowling, then said this. He said, and I quote, but Hooks's offensive was so beautifully executed that Gregg might possibly have felt a certain twinge of pride in being so closely associated with it. I think that's a fabulous compliment. I think it was Bradman I think it was Bradman who the same day said in the stands, I thought Frank Woolley had been born again. When you built a Greggy all over the ballpark, what did he say to you and what did you say back to him? Because you wouldn't have kept your mouth shut. No, I had a couple of good teachers. I had Ian Chappell who taught me at South Australia and I'd played against Ken Cunningham oh, yeah. when he played for Adelaide. <laughs> so I, he was. He's a gentleman, he was. So I, I'd known all about what to expect. It was. An exchange that's probably got out of uh, kilter over the last few years, of course, but it was just, uh, he just told me where the change rooms were, which I thought was a bit harsh, because I'd only come out of there <laughs> about 20 minutes ago, and I wasn't going to get lost. And uh, I just said to him, at least that I was an Australian playing in this game, not a Pommy import, right. uh, which was just determining his heritage or where it was. But after the game, Greggy came in, a bottle of beer, those long neck yep. bottles, a couple of long nets, couple of glasses and said, do you mind if I sit down and have a chat to you? So that's, that's what cricket's about. And that was a very strong memory. As you heard tonight, he knocked up the fastest 100 ever by an Australian in first class cricket. Again here at the Adelaide Oval, 100 in 43 minutes. He was only at the, in 40, he was only at the crease. He was only at the crease for 55 minutes to make 107. 17 boundaries and three sixes off only 34 deliveries. He scored off 29 of them. It was, the, it was the fifth fastest century ever anywhere in the world. The great Percy Fender in 1920 with Surrey made a century in 35 minutes. 
But David Hooks's 50 came in 17 minutes, Fenders in 19, and David Hooks made his runs against fast bowlers, not spinners. Yeah, it probably did just happen, except that I was in reasonable form at the time. I'd made uh, a 60 and a 90 the week yeah. before in Brisbane. I'd made 130 the first innings of that game. So I felt comfortable with my own batting. And of course, as a batsman, as you would well know, that's half the battle. Yep. I mean, you've got to feel comfortable with your feet and, your, mm. and the bat swing and all those things. And we'd never had a great relationship with Victoria on the ground. They've never been uh, a side to give or take very much. Or sorry, always take, never to give. And for some inane reason, Yallop declared at nine down at tea time on the last day. Now, my view has always been if you declare, is to strive for a result. Yes. Otherwise, don't declare. If we'd bowled them out at tea time in the last day, then Jeff Crow and Rick Darling would have opened the batting. But because he declared, I just felt a little bit cross and upset that, what's he doing that for? I mean, why, why do that? that? That's just making a mockery of what declarations are for. So I said to Rick Darling, let's get out there and just uh, try and give them some hurry up. With no real intention of getting 270 in a session, of course. Hooks on 99, faces McCurdy. Magnificent 100 to David Hooks. The return coming in as Hooks completes three runs, lifts his cap a lot, dons his cap as well in there because that is the most exciting century that you'll ever see in cricket anywhere. David Hooks 100 came in just 43 minutes. Hooksy, I'm honoured to be here tonight and I hope that I'm speaking on behalf of thousands and thousands of Australian sports people who can't be here, to whom you have given phenomenal pleasure. I, I well remember that first day-night game ever, the first ever in one day cricket at the SCG. We were all there like sardines. There was novelty about it, atmosphere, everything. You just had to be there. I have no idea who made runs or who got the wickets. The night was dominated by the fielding of David Hooks. And I remember as we left the ground, people were talking about it. You see, this man has this wonderful legacy from his involvement in the game of cricket that he's given innocent people like all of us who were just simple supporters and spectators, a tremendous buzz. I've no doubt at times you are hard to get on with. Too much has been made of that. Those who dare to be different are often difficult to accommodate. But the arrogance and the aggression and the preparedness to take risks and the refusal to entertain failure, these excited us. Then they disappointed us and then they stirred us up again. Let me sum it up this way. Tonight is a night when we salute a great sporting colleague who simply tilted at cricketing windmills, and he still is. And I say this to you, Hooksy, there can be no failure in a man who has not lost his courage, his character, his self-respect, or his self-confidence. He is still a king. This has been another presentation from Nine's Wide World of Sport.